I can still remember that day like it was yesterday. I grew up close to a lake over there by the Sea of Galilee. And I remember the day when my father, who was a great fisherman and a great businessman, when he first allowed me to go out on the boat by myself. My dad had been a fisherman for many years. He had done a great job with his business. We had lots of connections with different people. And finally, one day, he gave me the chance to take that boat out, to get those nets going. And I remember he said to me, James, today's the day for you to go fishing on your own. When I introduce myself, my name is James. And I'm here today because I want to tell you my story. I grew up and I remember being passionate about so many different things. I get into a little argument with one of my siblings. For example, my younger brother, John. We get into arguments and I would so passionately try to win that argument. But when my dad gave me the chance to go out, to represent him, to represent our business... I decided that I was going to do absolutely everything I could to make him proud and to be successful in that. Until one day. Until one day because, you see, my whole identity I would put all into my career. I thought, I'm going to be the best fisherman. I'm going to make my dad proud. My dad, Zebedee, You guys ever heard of my dad, Zebedee? He's a little bit famous. My mother, Salome. And of course, you've heard of my brother, John. And the thing was, I wanted to make him proud, and I thought one day this is going to be my business. My business that I will carry out. So we were doing our best. We were carrying this out. And I remember one day after we had gotten used to things, we had figured out the ropes, literally, how to catch the fish, how to sell them, how to make sure to make a good profit. I remember seeing just down the lake, there were some other people, Simon and Andrew. I don't know if you've heard of them. They were a couple of other fishermen. Simon and Andrew, they were brothers. And uh, I'm not going to say that they were competition, but uh, they were fishermen, we were fishermen. We're trying to do the same business, sell the same fish but we grew up together we knew each other and I looked down over there and I saw that what they were normally supposed to be doing fishing they had all of a sudden stopped because someone had gone and spoken with them and Peter and Andrew had gotten out of their boat and as they got closer I could see it was Peter Andrew and there was one other person and soon I realized it was Jesus this guy from Nazareth. He was a little bit away. Uh, his hometown was a little bit away from uh, the Sea of Galilee. But I had started to hear things about who Jesus was. People had started to flock around him because of the miracles that he was doing. And the things that he was doing was, I would say, almost unbelievable. How could he heal people? How could he provide for needs that there's no other way for things to be taken care of? And so as he started to make his way closer and closer, he called out to me, James, and my brother, John. And he called out using these words I was familiar with, these words that rabbis would extend to people. And he called out with these words, follow me, follow me. Oh, I see you've got it up here on the screen for us. That's good. That's what he called us. Oh, you've got a picture. Well, that's not exactly what Jesus looked like, but uh, it's close. And uh, there's Peter. Uh, Peter wasn't actually that good looking, so uh, sorry about that, Peter. But uh, yeah, that's me. I was taller than all the rest. Here's the thing. I always kind of thought of myself as somebody who kind of deserved a little bit of the status that I had. You see, my parents, not only were they successful business people, But they had lots of connections. 
connections with some of the religious leaders. We lived way up north in this area of Galilee, but if you travel south a ways and you get to Jerusalem, we even knew people down there. And so I, when Jesus came to me and he invited me to follow him, there was a part of me that thought, yes, Jesus has great taste in disciples. I'm somebody who should be with him walking day and night. But there was also a part of me that realized, you know what? I'm not all that I should be. So it was both uh, humbling and encouraging when Jesus invited me to follow him. Me and my brother that day, our passion changed from what we had grown up thinking life was all about. Fishing for fish, making business, having connections in the social classes. But that day... My passion turned from that to being a follower of Jesus. One of the hallmarks of who I am is being zealous and being passionate. And when I started to see not only what Jesus could do, the miracles, all those things, but when I started to see what those miracles were pointing to, who he was, that he was, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, that's when I became passionate. I want to let you know today I'm here to tell my story. What I want you to know is that I became a passionate follower of Jesus Christ because of what I saw in Jesus. I'm going to share three different stories with you about that, but before I do, I'd like to pray. I'd like to pray. Now, uh, me and the disciples, when we were with Jesus, even the 12 of us were not as good of a prayers as we would love to have been. So there was one time we said, Jesus, could you teach us how to pray? Could you teach us what this should sound like? And he told us that we can pray directly to the Father. I'm going to pray the prayer that he taught me to pray. Would you please join me as we open our time together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus taught us, and I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that way, prayed to the Father, and prayed and closed it out with those three things that he mentioned. That his is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. The kingdom, the power, and the glory. Today, I want to tell you, I was able to see with my own eyes the kingdom of God. I was able to see the power of God, and I was able to see the glory of God himself. I want to tell you the three stories, one about each of those. And uh, the first one, I want to let you know, I became a passionate disciple, passionate follower of Jesus, when I saw his resurrection power. When I saw the resurrection power of Jesus. All right, I want to set the, uh, set the scene for you a little bit. I told you that I grew up living by the lake. It's great to be able to get out there and smell like fish a little bit. And uh, I remember there was one day we were there. Jesus had just come back from across the lake. He'd come on over, and uh, a lot of people had started to hear about who he was and what he could do, the power that he had. So when he showed up, there was already a crowd waiting for him. People were coming around, people were clamoring, and some of the people just wanted to see a miracle. Some of the people needed a miracle. And one of the people who needed a miracle was actually one of those people I was talking about, 
one of the people who was a leader within the synagogue. A leader within the synagogue. His name is Jairus. Jairus showed up, and he started talking, and he presented a request before Jesus. He said, Jesus, my daughter, she is sick. Later, we would find out that, uh, that she was 12 years old. 12-year-old girl needed help. She really needed to be healed. She, her situation was that dire. And so Jesus said, I am going to go with you. I'm going to go with you, Jairus. And so they set off, and they start journeying. And let me tell you, sometimes the streets get crowded, especially if you've got somebody who can heal people with you, if you've got the Son of God with you. And we're walking through the streets, and uh, people are bumping into each other. It's crowded. And we're walking along, and we're trying to make good time because, remember, Jairus is hoping that Jesus will be able to get there before his daughter passes away. And as we're walking, all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and he asks the question, who touched me? And we're all like, uh, I think I did, but like not on purpose. I'm sorry, okay? You ever have that? So you're riding along in a journey and like, oh, she touched me. Say, so he touched me. Stay out of my space. Well, here's the thing. Jesus said, someone touched me. And we turned and there was a woman. And this woman started to explain what she had been through. She explained that she had been bleeding for 12 years. Bleeding for 12 years. Unclean, ceremonially speaking, for 12 years. Ostracized from society for 12 years, having gone to doctor after doctor and suffering much and spending all she had to try to find some way to have wholeness. This womb, which is supposed to be a place of being life-giving, was one that was sick and life-draining. But Jesus started to talk to her, and what we found out was that just because she came and she touched the hem of his garment, I think she probably could have gotten in trouble for that, but just because she did that, Jesus turned to her, and we found out she had been healed after 12 years and what did jesus say to her he said daughter your faith has healed you go in peace and be freed from your suffering just like that the power of jesus went out and healed this woman who had tried every other remedy imaginable man we were we were feeling amazing Look at this, Jesus, our rabbi, our teacher, the one who invited us to be a part of what he's doing. He healed this woman. His power went out. We thought, wow, she'd been suffering for 12 years. And we thought, oh, there's this girl, and she's 12 years old. And it was at that moment when Jesus was speaking to this woman that someone showed up from the house of Jairus. And we looked over, and you should have seen the look on Jairus' face. His face fell. Because that messenger from his house said, Jairus, your daughter has died. She's no longer living. There's nothing more this man can do for us, so don't bother him anymore. Man, the look on the face of a father who loved his daughter, went to go try to find someone who could bring healing to her body. And now this messenger says, why bother the teacher anymore? But Jesus heard. And what does Jesus say? Don't be afraid, just believe. Wow, me and the other disciples were like, okay, Jesus, that's bold. We know what happens. Just because we live in the first century doesn't mean we don't understand what happens when a person dies. We know how to tell that they're really gone. We know that once a person dies, there's no coming back from that. Death is more powerful than any one of us, Jesus. So what could you possibly have in store when you tell this person, don't be afraid, just believe? Okay, the story's not over, I guess. So we continue to go. We make it all the way there. 
And on the one hand, me and the other disciples, there's part of us that's like, all right, let's see what Jesus is going to do. And there's a part of us that is absolutely dreading the experience because we've been to funerals before. And my people, we know how to mourn. We don't hold it back. We don't pretend that everything's all right. We let loose. We're not afraid to cry out and to wail and to weep because we know that death is a, one of our greatest enemies. And so we get there, and I'm so thankful Jesus allowed me to be one who would go in the room. He said, Peter, James, and John, come in with me. He gets there, and he starts to ask everybody. People are wailing. They're crying. And Jesus goes in, and he says, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but is sleeping. And at that point, we're like, Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Jesus, come on. Read the room a little bit. People know what's going on, Jesus. Why would you say the child is just sleeping? But what I later would find out, it wasn't Jesus who needed to read the room. It was the room that needed to read Jesus. So Jesus, he sent people out of the room. We got to stay in there, and Jesus came over to this girl, and we could see she had passed. But Jesus reached out his hand. He reached out his hand. He took her hand, and he said the words, Talitha kumi. You guys don't know Aramaic? Okay, all right, I'll translate for you. Talitha kumi, that means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And her eyes opened up. And she sat up. And she started walking around. And you should have seen the look on Jairus' face when everyone in that room saw something that was almost unbelievable. If we hadn't seen it with our own eyes, we wouldn't have believed. And that girl, she was raised. What an incredible thing. We saw the resurrection power of Jesus. We were all overcome with amazement. I want to let you know something. That wasn't the last time I saw someone raised from the dead by the power of God through Jesus. Later on in his ministry, Jesus would go to his friend. We didn't know why Jesus took so long to get there when Lazarus was sick. But he waited so that they would be able to see the power of God. And when we got there, he raised Lazarus from the dead. What a day of celebration that was. And later on, we would see Jesus himself raised from the grave. And not only that, but many saints raised from the grave, going around testifying about the power of God. We got to see God's resurrection power. And I want to tell you something. If you're here today and you want to grow in your passion for the Lord, maybe you find yourself in a place where you feel like you just even don't care that much about your relationship with God. If you want to grow in passion, you need to come face to face with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. I look forward to the day when me and all the rest of the disciples who have passed away and our souls are waiting, our souls are present with the Lord, and we're waiting for the day when Christ will return and our bodies will be raised and we will be reunited, our souls and our bodies, just as Jesus already is, and we will be able to worship him for eternity in that state. I look forward to that time, but I want you to take a close look at the resurrection power of Jesus. That's the first thing that fostered my passion. But there was another thing. A little bit of time went on, and uh, my passion as a disciple of Jesus grew when I saw the unveiled glory of Jesus. I told you already about thine is the power, thine is the glory. We're going to talk about his glory. We got to see it in an incredible way. So there we were. Jesus brought us again, Peter, James, and John. And uh, I always felt pretty good about the fact that uh, I was in the top three. I'm like, oh, that's good. Top three disciples of Jesus. Okay, so you had Peter, and he was the older brother of Andrew. And here's me, James, and I'm the older brother of John. 
And uh, Jesus picked three of us, and I always kind of thought, well, Peter's always running his mouth. He's always talking too much. And so if I just keep my mouth shut, maybe Jesus will recognize me as the greatest. Uh, John and I actually, we got our mom involved, and we had our mom, Salome, go and talk to Jesus and say, hey, these are probably the greatest, so they're going to sit next to you when your kingdom comes, right? And uh, we got in trouble for that because apparently that's not the way the kingdom of God works. But here's the thing, we're hanging out the three of us, Peter, myself, and John. And Jesus says, we're going up the mountain. We're like, oh, the mountain, great. Uh, we get to go rock climbing with the Rock of Ages. If you've ever been, uh, been up a mount, it's, it's not easy. It's hard work, we were getting up there, it's a journey. And, and finally we sit down, and uh, I can't remember if we had snacks or something, but uh, next thing you know, the glory of Jesus was unveiled before our very eyes. I didn't realize just how much glory Jesus had veiled. When Jesus came to earth and he was born there in Bethlehem, when he took on human flesh, he did it so that he could identify with us, yes. He did it so that his sacrifice could count for us, that he was doing this on our behalf. But Jesus took on human flesh to veil his glory because if he didn't, one look at that and we would be dead. We've heard the stories of old, the stories about how Moses encountered God and Moses wanted to see the glory of God and God said, if you see it, you're gonna die. So I'm gonna tuck you back in this rock. I'm gonna let you see out just a little bit and as I pass by, I'm just gonna let you see just a little bit of my glory. And even that was almost too much for Moses. But as we got up there, all of a sudden, Jesus was transfigured before us. We were able to see his glory. His face was shining like the sun. And I know a thing or two about the sun. I've been sunburned plenty of times. And I know that if you look at the sun, even for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, you're going to go blind because it's just that bright. And Jesus' face right there before us was shining like the sun. His glory was so much that his clothes started to glow. His clothes became white as light. And if that wasn't enough, all of a sudden, there show up, literally, my two childhood heroes, Moses and Elijah. And Jesus is talking to them. We're like, what in the world is going on? And I'm just trying to keep my mouth shut, right? Because I'm like, I'm going to say something dumb. Well, Peter, he didn't have that, all right? He just starts talking. He says, Jesus, are we going camping? I'm going to build us some tents. We'll make one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And he's just running his mouth when all of a sudden, not only was Jesus there, but a cloud overshadowed us. A cloud. We're like, what is going on with this bright cloud? And a voice started to speak from the cloud. Now, I told you before, Jesus ta taught us how to pray. He taught us to say, Our Father. And I can't tell you how many times I prayed that. Our Father, our Father, our Father. And on this day, the Father spoke back to us. From this bright cloud, the Father spoke, and he said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And we're like, we got it. We got it. We understand God. We got to listen to him. We thought he was the Messiah, but now we know he is the son of God in the flesh. He's here with us. And I told you before, I started to think about some of those things, not only how good it is to be in the presence of God and to see his glory, but the sinful things in my heart that I'd even thought, okay, Jesus, why are we coming up this mountain today? This is kind of a pain. All those things, the sin within my heart, I recognized I could die from this. And so I was terrified. I fell on my face. I wasn't the only one. Peter and John, they fell down too. And we were shaking. We were terrified. We didn't know what was going to happen. But Jesus reached down with that same hand and he touched us. And he told us to look up, and when we looked up, Moses was gone, and Elijah was gone, and Jesus was still there. That's all right. He's the main event of this story. Jesus was there, and he said these words, rise and have no fear. 
He must have read our minds because we had fear definitely going on in our hearts. He said, rise and have no fear. And when we lifted up our eyes, we didn't see anybody else but Jesus. What an incredible thing. I want to let you know, I've been worshiping Jesus with his glory unveiled for almost 2,000 years in heaven. And I can tell you, his glory is more beautiful than anything else you've ever seen. More holy, more awesome, more perfect, more majestic than anything you can even imagine. And uh, I want you to be able to live your life here on earth. But when you come and you join the rest of us disciples in heaven, it's going to be an amazing time to see him for who he really is and to worship him for all of eternity. If you want to grow in your passion for the Lord, you've got to understand his glory. If you want to grow in your passion for the Lord, there's other things we get fired up about. There's other things we get passionate about. Maybe it's something that you own. Like for me, it was my, my fishing boat. I thought it was super cool. It was the latest model. I was passionate about that until I saw just how much greater Jesus was than anything else this earth has to offer. So if you want to grow in your passion with the Lord, come to a greater theological understanding and experience of God's glory as it truly is. Well, there's one more thing. I talked about his power. I talked about how I got to see face to face his glory. And I also got to see his kingdom. I got to see his kingdom. And his kingdom is one that is not what I was expecting. Many of us disciples, we were expecting, even people were asking, Lord, is this the time when you're going to set up your kingdom and overthrow the Romans and uh, uh, we're all going to come in and we're going to rule with you uh, here in uh, Israel and we'll be, we'll be good to go. Is it almost here, Jesus? Because uh, we're ready to rule alongside you. But Jesus' kingdom was a kingdom of radical compassion. I was able to see with my own eyes the compassion of Jesus even for those who were walking in opposition to him. About a week before Jesus went to the cross in my place, we were there in our hometown right by Galilee, and we realized that Jesus was getting super focused. He was setting his face toward Jerusalem, as some have said. He knew he was going to go to the cross, and he was getting focused on it. So there we were in Galilee. I'm going to draw a little map for you here, okay? So up here is uh, the Sea of Galilee, all right? And uh, over here is all the place that we live. Naz uh, Nazareth is over here. Right next to it's Cana, where Jesus transformed the water into wine. Uh, up here is kind of where we mostly would hang out. And what we realize up here in the Sea of Galilee, then there's down the Jordan River, and then there's the Dead Sea here at the bottom. And Jerusalem's over here. So we needed to go from here to here. And I want to tell you something. Right in the middle is this place called Samaria. I don't know if you heard of the Samaritans. We were always surprised, Jesus, why would you make a Samaritan the hero of one of your main parables. And I don't know if you've ever heard of that, the Good Samaritan. Jesus, this is, this is a person that for most of us and our countrymen, we have mostly hatred and disdain. Here are people who uh, were part of the, the people of God. They were supposed to be worshiping the one true God, but they started to marry people who were worshiping pagan gods, pagan idols, false gods. And that's what the, the people in Samaria were. And they started to worship a little bit differently, come up with some of their own writings, have their own different places where they would worship that weren't really sanctioned by the law and the prophets. And so we had these people, and we didn't really like them that much. So when we had to go from up here in Galilee down to Jerusalem, what we would normally do is come over here, cross over the Jordan River, make our journey, cross back over the Jordan River just so that we didn't have to be around the people 
in Samaria. Because I told you one of my childhood heroes was Elijah. I always kind of thought of myself as an Elijah type. Kind of feisty. Kind of passionate, right? And I remember growing up and hearing one of my favorite bedtime stories was this one thing that Elijah did. Because there were some, some bad kings and queens back in the day. Have you ever heard of Ahab and Jezebel? They were bad. And they had a son, Ahaziah. And I'm not sure what he was doing, but he was up on his, in his palace and somehow he fell off. And he got injured, which I thought kind of served him right for uh, rebelling against God. But he decided that he was going to go send 50 of his men to go and find out what was going to happen to him. But he didn't go to a prophet of the one true God. He went to a prophet of Beelzebul or Beelzebub. It means Lord of the Flies. And we actually started to call it Lord of the Dung. Okay, that's what we, uh, that's what we kind of had a nickname for this false god. So he sent these 50 people and God told Elijah, you're going to go intercept them. So Elijah went, he's wearing his stuff. He actually dressed a lot like John the Baptist. They were cut from the same cloth, literally. Animal skins with a belt. They were kind of wild out there. And God said, go out there, you're going to intercept these 50 people. So there's Elijah, and they said, hey. They were yelling at him. And, uh, and Elijah said, if I really am a prophet of the one true God, then let, Are you guys ready for this? This is my favorite part. Let fire fall from heaven, and boom, it did. God sent fire down from heaven and burned up these 50 people, okay? Then Ahaziah sent another 50 people. Elijah said the same thing. If I am the prophet of the one true God, let fire fall from heaven, boom, and they were singed. I love that part because it's like, yeah, these evil doers, they were judged by God. Uh, the third group of 50 people were like, please don't kill us. And uh, so Elijah went with them, and they kind of resolved the situation a little bit differently. But as we're traveling up here from Galilee down to Jerusalem, we don't know what all is in store, but Jesus knows. And he decides we're going to go right through Samaria. Right through Samaria. This is the place where, like I said, the Good Samaritan parable was about him. Jesus had gone to Samaria and talked to a woman. I don't understand. Jesus broke some social norms when he went and talked to this woman who uh, she had like four ex-husbands and her current relationship status was complicated. But Jesus decided to go and to communicate who he was with this woman. Not only to tell her that he was the living water, but to give this woman new life. Why would he do that to these people that most of us didn't like? And so we sent people ahead. He said, oh, go find somewhere for us to stay. We went down and we got there. And the people who were supposed to be there and have set up like a, a hotel, kind of like a little uh, Airbnb somewhere for us. I'm not sure what Airbnb is, but I've heard about it. And everybody that we came to said, we don't want anything to do with Jesus. We don't want anything to do with you guys. And me and John, we looked at each other and were like, Jesus, we got an idea. We've been dreaming about this since we were young. Jesus, do you want us to call, just like Elijah, fire to fall down from heaven, and we can obliterate these people for the glory of God? This was their idea. That's actually why Jesus started calling us the sons of thunder. Sons of thunder is born in Jesus. It's kind of tricky to say. So sons of thunder... And Jesus turned, and we thought he was going to be like, let's do it. <laughs> but that's not what he said. He rebuked us. Our hearts were not mirroring his heart, his compassionate heart, the love that he had even for the people who rejected him. And while they were yet sinners, Christ died for them. We made our way all the way down to Jerusalem. A lot of stuff happened that week. And Jesus ended up on the cross. And he died in our place. Three days later, we saw his resurrection power. When he rose up from that grave, he revealed himself to us. We were so excited. And he sent us out. I told you before a little bit about... Uh, Oh, you've got, uh, you've got the Law and the Prophets here before you? That's good, Law and the Prophets. And uh, you got some new stuff. 
Oh, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew was always writing stuff down. Everywhere we went, Matthew was writing it down. That's good. He put it to good use. Matthew and then, uh, oh, Mark. Yep, heard about that guy. Hung out with some of the apostles. Dr. Luke. Yeah, he was really precise. Everything he wrote down. And you've got one by... Uh, Oh, John. Yeah, my brother. My little brother, all right? The Gospel of John, that's good. Yeah, I heard he wrote down John, and then he wrote another one. He called that one First John. He wrote another one called the Second John. Third John, I'm like, really? That's very creative of you. Name every last one after yourself. And then there's one revelation that he wrote on the Isle of Patmos. That one's a little bit trippy, okay. But here's the thing. As Jesus rose from the grave, the very next book after John is Acts. And the eighth verse of there says this. Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, and he sends us out. And the last thing he says before he goes to heaven is, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. We're like, got it. You will be my witnesses in Judea. We're like, got it. You will be my witnesses in Samaria. We're like, are you sure? Are you sure, Jesus? These are the people that, like, we don't like them. Jesus said, my compassionate heart extends to them. And he also said to the ends of the earth, which is great. It's why wherever it is that we're here today, we're able to worship him as well. So guess what? Some disciples did it. They went out. In Acts chapter 8, you can read about it because there was a deacon named Philip, and he went to Samaria. He wasn't sure how people would respond because before they had rejected Jesus. But Philip went, explained the gospel to them, and so many people came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm ashamed to say it. The people I wanted to obliterate with fire from heaven, Jesus had a different plan for them. And i got to tell you something. I've been worshiping with these brothers and sisters from Samaria for a couple thousand years, and I can't wait for you to join us. I became a passionate follower of Jesus not because I was awesome, not because of anything that I had that could well up within me and, and make me somebody amazing. I told you that... Uh, there were times I, I thought I was all that. Times that I thought I should be first. And there's one thing that Jesus allowed me to be first in. Because I told you, Jesus sent us out. He said, go tell us. Go be my witnesses. And I could not keep my mouth shut. I was telling everybody, Jesus is alive. He's the Son of God. He's the creator of you and your family. You can be saved if you put your trust in Jesus, the risen Savior. I was telling everybody about it. And, uh, and so people up at the top, they didn't like it. And so on the last day of my life, it was King Herod. I can't remember. It kind of happened fast. I'm not sure if he's the one that had the sword or the executioner. But my very last memory on this earth was that I got to be the first one to be killed for Jesus. I was beheaded. That very last memory I had, the sword came down. And just as it happened on the mountain, I looked up and I saw Jesus' glorious face. I'm passionate about following Jesus because I've seen who he is. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let me pray. God, you are so good to us. You sent your son. We've seen what he's done. Lord, the times we get distracted, the times we stray, Lord, the times we're not quite sure if we even care about our relationship with you, God, Lord, make us passionate because of what we see in Jesus. God, I pray for every person in this room. Lord, if there's anyone here who has not yet experienced salvation, Lord, I pray that today is the day that they would turn to you. That they would, God, uh, that they would say, God, I surrender my life to you because you are God, you are a risen Savior, and you're the only way for my sins to be forgiven. 
Lord, I look forward to the day when all these brothers and sisters will join us in glory, when our bodies will be resurrected on that last day, and we'll be able to experience your full presence for all of eternity. Lord, because we know that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.